Ian Goldin este profesor de globalizare și dezvoltare la Universitatea Oxford din Marea Britanie. Economist de talie mondială cu o vastă experiență în practica dezvoltării, Ian Goldin a ocupat de-a lungul anilor importante poziții de conducere. Director fondator al Institutului Martin pentru Cercetarea Interdisciplinară a Globalizării de la Universitatea Oxford, vicepreședinte și director de dezvoltare al Băncii Mondiale, economist principal al Băncii Europene pentru Reconstrucție și Dezvoltare. De asemenea, Ian Goldin a condus mai multe programe în cadrul Organizației pentru Cooperare și Dezvoltare Economică, a fost director executiv al Băncii de Dezvoltare din Africa de Sud, dar și consilier al președintelui Nelson Mandela. Profesorul Ian Goldin a publicat numeroase cărți de specialitate, lucrări în care analizează, din perspective diferite, dimensiunea complexă a dezvoltării. Cu ocazia recentei vizite în România, Școala Națională de Studii Politice și Administrative i-a decernat titlul de doctor honoris causa, iar profesorul Ian Goldin a acordat un interviu în exclusivitate televiziunii române. Professor Ian Goldin, welcome to the Romanian National Television. You are launching today the Romanian version of your book, The Pursuit of Development. You have written extensively, included in this book, about development. But what do we actually mean by this concept? Development is about human progress. It's about many things uh, which matter deeply to us. Our life expectancy, our incomes, our education, our knowledge of what's happening, our health, in many ways, and our ability to develop our countries, our communities, uh, and civilization. So it's a very broad concept, and it's, I think, everything that matters. Why is development happening in some countries and in other uh, not? Um, are only the governments responsible for this? That's a very difficult question, why development happens in some countries and not in others, why sometimes it moves quickly and sometimes it goes backwards. Uh, and of course, Romania has had this experience with its history. In, even over the last 50 years, it's seen this dramatic change in development prospects. Governments have a role to play, but most important also does the private sector. Uh, it's the private sector that really has to create jobs, that has to create dynamism and innovation. But the framework that governments create, the education system, the health system, the infrastructure, the regulation is vital uh, to ensure that the country prospers. So both the private sector and government sector are vital and so too other actors, civil society, uh, everyone in the society has a role to play to ensure that development is effective. Migration is a way for people to escape poverty. In the last years, Europe faces a mass migration and the refugees rising tight. That means thousands and thousands of people came here from Near East and North African countries. How can the European Union deal with it? Migration has always in history been the way that people have escaped uh, poverty, famines, wars, etc. This is very old and in many times in European history there was mass migration. A third of Sweden migrated, a third of Ireland migrated, a third of Italy migrated, and we've seen mass migration. So it's not new. Uh, what's new, of course, is the higher walls that we have around our societies and the fact that our levels of income are so different now. Uh, I believe the European Union has to accept migrants and refugees particularly, where people are in fear of their lives by staying where they are, but it needs to do so in an effectively managed way. People need to be distributed around the European Union, uh, the numbers need to be carefully managed, and of course when people arrive in countries, they need careful regulation. So we need to ensure that people follow the laws of our countries, we need to also ensure that they have rights, uh, rights to work, rights for education and health. This is a very big challenge of our time. I think it's one that we need to discuss very deeply in our societies. Um, my hope is that we can accept more people, uh, but that we can effectively control uh, this more, control our borders more, and also when people come we can treat them with greater respect. But uh, will we stand the globalization as a progressive force to the challenge of migration? Because uh, other countries uh, maybe will revive the nationalism? Yes, it's a big challenge. Globalization uh, brings many benefits but many risks as well. And 
one of the things we're seeing, I think, is far from the world becoming more flat, it's becoming more mountainous. In other words, some people are benefiting enormously from globalization and integration, rapid change, and other people are being left behind. And when things change more rapidly, people get left behind quicker. So a great responsibility of our societies is to ensure that we are more inclusive that people do not get left behind. And that also means that people are able to get to where the jobs are. So house prices, transport systems, things like that really matter for our societies. And if, we, if more and more people feel left behind, they will revolt, they will reject globalization. And that's very dangerous because it brings many benefits as well. So we need to manage this much more effectively. We need much more inclusive societies and we need to ensure that the benefits are more widely shared. What is made up of the so-called dark side of globalization and how can the world nations manage these risks? There are two big downsides to globalization, or maybe three. The one is growing inequality, that some people benefit more than others and that leads to big fractures in society, so bringing people along. The second big downside risk of globalization is what I call the butterfly defect, that not only good things spread, really bad things spread through interconnectivity. Cascading financial crises, pandemics, uh, cyber attacks, the underbelly of integration, and this needs to be more effectively managed through coordination. And the third great uh, downside of it is that when everyone or more and more people enjoy progress, we get more spillovers, we get more collective failure, climate change, because more people are climbing the energy curve. The exploitation of the oceans and the fisheries, antibiotic resistance, the depletion of water, this is the downside of globalization. Success, progress, brings more responsibility. And so we need to concentrate more on these spillovers uh, managing climate change, managing antibiotic resistance, managing the benefits of globalization. That means more responsibility for us as individuals and our governments to coordinate and to ensure that we can all benefit and that we do not destroy the planet and each other because of the success of globalization. The new technologies and their application in the medicine and genetics could increase the average age of population. In this respect, what will be the future of the pension system? Rapid improvements in life expectancy is one of the benefits of globalization, and we are seeing uh, very rapid rises in life expectancy. This is a good thing, but the combination of increasing life expectancy and declining returns on savings because of very low interest rates, quantitative easing, etc., is a looming disaster. So what we're seeing is that the amount that people have to save today is maybe a hundred times more than it was when Social Security and pensions were designed in the 1970s because life expectancy has improved by about 20 years and interest rates have gone down from 4% real to close to zero, half a percent real. That means you have to save much more Where's the savings going to come from? And it, how are we going to do this? The other bad thing that's happening is that the regulatory environment, which is trying to stop the next financial crisis, is forcing banks and pension funds to invest in what they call risk-free assets. But that's pushing the yield, pushing interest rates down, and it's meaning that our savings are not going into what has higher returns, which is equity investments, private sector investments, but going into basically government bonds and other very low return assets. So we need to change the regulatory environment as well uh, to ensure that we are able to save in a way that invests in the future and increases our returns as well. Brexit. Was it a good idea? Is this an anti-globalization standing? I think Brexit was a disastrous idea. I think it's very bad for Great Britain. I think it's very bad for the European Union as well, because I believe that Britain played a very positive role uh, in Europe. So I, I think it's a bad thing, 
the reason I think it happened was firstly big mistakes of judgment on the behalf of uh, Cameron and other politicians. Uh, but the reason that the, they didn't believe the majority of the population would support it, the reason the majority of the population did support it was because I think people feel that the experts, that the authorities are wrong. If the financial crisis had not happened, we would not have Brexit. It was a response to the collapse of the expert system and trust in experts and authority. It was also the fact that Britain has been very bad at explaining why Europe is good. Both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party in the UK were anti-Europe and this is not a good thing. So Britain, I think, needs to talk for Europe if it wants to be part of Europe. And the third reason, I think, why it failed was that Britain is overcoming its crisis of not being a global power anymore. It's an identity crisis. We used to think we ran the world, imperial power. We used to think we were very important. We are becoming less and less important. And this psychological adjustment, and the same thing is happening in the US, and part of the explanation Trump won, is, I think, adjusting to the reality of a more globalized and effective world. The rise of China, the rise of Europe, the rise of many others. And finally, inequality has increased. So London has done very well. The places that are changing rapidly have done very well. London voted overwhelmingly to remain in Europe. It also has the highest share of migrants. This was not an anti-immigrant, anti-change agenda. The, the places that voted for Brexit were the places that are not changing and with very low immigrant populations, Wales, Cornwall, other parts of the UK. So there was a lot. And then finally, this is fake news. Uh, the idea that it costs us, there was this bus that said 350 million pounds a week will come back to England if we Brexit. It was completely yeah. not true, but it was fake. And of course, what no one was talking about is the cost. We're now talking about an agreement of maybe 40 billion pounds <laughs> to pay to Europe. Or 60. To, or 60. Um, plus all sorts of other expenses to build a new customs, to build the new infrastructure. No one was talking about that, but they were spreading false rumors. So I think it's a good example, and we saw other examples in the US around Trump, where you have to engage in communication to counter this fake news. What is, in your opinion, uh, the future of, uh, economic future of the uh, European Union and uh, Great Britain after Brexit? I'm a great believer in the European Union. I think, you know, I, I joined with Romania in celebrating 10, ten years. Um, I think uh, it, for all the reasons we know, most important piece in Europe, but also the size of the market, Europe will be double the size of the US uh, over the next 20 years. Uh, it will be a global player in all respects. Uh, in a way that was inconceivable. The UK will become less and less significant. Uh, the expertise in Europe, UK will become less significant. I think the anti-immigration stance will undermine the competitiveness of Britain. It will undermine the attractiveness of Britain as a location for global companies. Uh, of course, uh, they will relocate to other European capitals. So this is going to accelerate the marginalization of the UK. Uh, of course, it's still a great place. We hope that Oxford will uh, maintain its competitiveness yeah. uh, as a leading university in the world, but it will get more and more difficult to do so uh, in this process. And the UK will have to fight harder and harder. So I hope that over time we are able to reverse this. This is maybe a dream, um, but Europe, I think, is in a very good, good position. Europe has many challenges, of course. It has the, the fiscal challenges, the, the economic challenges, it has demographic challenges, which are very significant. It has the refugee challenges. It has many challenges, but I think it has the collective expertise and wisdom to meet these challenges in a way that no other region in the world does. So I'm very optimistic. It will not grow at the rate of China at six or seven percent. It will continue to grow at one and a half, two percent. But at, if it can ensure that there's redistribution, that the whole of Europe prospers, 
uh, I think it's important that it does so. Of course, it needs to counter the extremism that we see. The extremism we see in France, in Germany, in Poland, in Hungary is a rising challenge. And I hope this is a wake-up call together with Brexit, a wake-up call for the Commission and the leaders of Europe to recognize they need to do much more to ensure that people really do benefit across Europe from what's happening. Romania has in the last years an important rate of economic growth. Is this a good thing or a bad one? Having in the eye that the development of the country is much slower, probably the, on the last places in uh, Europe. And congratulate Romania on really the fastest growth in Europe. Um, and it's, it really is a tribute, I think, to many, many uh, factors and the leadership, etc. So of I think growth is a good thing uh, because it gives you more resource. When you're growing more rapidly, you can invest without taking, without cutting. It's easier to do politics in, in high growth than slow, slow growth. You're not fighting over a fixed cake. You're fighting over expanding resources. So this is good. The question is, is this incredible opportunity used effectively? It's a strategic moment for Romania. And the question is, how is this additional resource used uh, to ensure responsible macroeconomic management, but also to ensure investments in education, investments in inclusive growth, investments which really do provide the foundation for future development. Uh, what we've seen in many countries in Europe is rapid growth followed by crisis, including in Spain, extremism growing, uh, and in some other countries, Poland, uh, we see the extremist growing as well. So it's very important that the cohesion of the society, and I think that's about investing in people and in safety nets, etc., that that is done, and renewal. Uh, the future of Romania, the future of all countries is very different. The pace of change is accelerating. And so, you know, to ask what is Romania going to be in 2030? Where will it be? What is the industry? What, is the, what are people going to be employed in? How does it engage in this world of automation, robotics, etc.? What will its role in Europe and the world be? Is this is the time when you have the capacity to think because you have resource. Corruption has a negative influence on development. How can we deal with it? Corruption is a cancer. Corruption is everywhere. I know there are big issues in Romania at the moment around this. I've been following this. I, I think it's very important to recognize what corruption does. It undermines democracy. It undermines decision-making, where some people are able to capture resources and through that have an influence which is not a representative one, a secret. Uh, so it is, it's a terribly corrosive force. And it's very important, I think, that corruption, when it's seen, is identified and dealt with very severely, because it's an example. In my country that I grew up in, South Africa, I've seen corruption really reverse the gains of President Mandela and I and the team that was involved. And it's a tragedy when that happens. Not, it's a tragedy for the whole country, and for, in, in our case, I think, for the region. Uh, it can happen very quickly, and I think it's very important that it's not just simply seen as a money problem. Uh, you know, it's not just a capture of resources. It's actually a political economy question. Is, is our country accountable? Are our leaders accountable? And do they have special privileges? Or do the rich have different rules to the poor? Uh, one of the reasons for extremism and the growth of extremism in the US, I believe, uh, and in parts of Europe, is that people believe the rich have different rules to the poor. They believe that, uh, that somehow they're creating a system which is not fair. And fairness requires no corruption. So I think uh, zero tolerance on corruption is absolutely essential for sustainable development. Thousands of doctors and nurses from Romania migrated in the last 10 years in Western Europe. While Romania has invested much in their education and our health system is in need of them, other countries benefit of their training. Is that correct? This, this question of the brain drain 
uh, is a universal question. I mean, across Africa, you know, the World Bank and other agencies are investing in training teachers, training nurses, then they go and work in rich countries and the same in the Caribbean and it's a, it's a global problem. Uh, Philippines, many, many countries and of course Romania has experienced this. My own view is that um, it, it's a major drain you investing in human resources, as you say, that other people are benefiting from. There are ways of dealing with that. You can create an education system which uh, requires people to put back into their country, either by the number of years that a doctor or a nurse has to work at home, or by funding the education from a, from a loan, that if you stay in the country, you don't have to repay the loan. If you go away, you have to repay it. But in the end, I think one should be also optimistic about the fact that this is a, these resources are not disappearing. What we see in Poland is net back migration. Um, there are more Poles going back to Poland than leaving Poland at the moment. And so when you need the resources, and when your economy is doing better, and I think Romania is at this turning point now, I think you will find people coming back. I think it's also the case when they go away, they don't go away completely. They send money home, they send ideas, and they bring ideas home. They stay connected. And there are many families, I'm sure, in Romania, as there are around the world, who live off these remittances that the migrants send home. So, and those are higher than they would be if they stayed at home. So, the, it's not the case that these people are just lost. I think they, they, there's brain circulation, they come back um, and they bring ideas and they send money uh, while they're away. But it can be managed, the system, to be more effective. I think you can encourage people to come back, you can encourage that the money they send back is used effectively uh, and of course ensuring that the diaspora feels part of the society, communicates its ideas, contributes and comes back is something that is vital. You told us about uh, the climate changing. Um, the climate is in continuing and rapid transformation worldwide. Of this point of view, how would be influenced uh, the life on the planet uh, in an economic sense by this, by this uh, changing? Climate change is, is a really massive, most probably the most important thing that's happening on a planetary level at the moment. Uh, so. I'm absolutely convinced that we're in a dramatic period of climate change, which means at least uh, two degrees uh, average. And the average remembers for the whole planet, including the oceans. So many parts of the land by much more than two degrees. And of course, averages don't really matter to people. What matters is extremes. So a minute of a temperature too high or too low will kill your crop. A wind that's too strong, a hailstone that's too big, a snowstorm that's too fierce. So it's the extremes that are growing as well. I believe what we will see is a growing recognition of this. It's poor people in poor countries and coastal cities that will feel it most. Oceans will rise by at least a meter, maybe more, uh, this century. Uh, big storms. Uh, so I think we'll see a growing recognition that this increases inequality, that this has run. So we'll move. I'm absolutely convinced the only question is when, I think over the next 20, 30 years, to a zero carbon world, zero net carbon world, which means that we basically go totally to renewable resources uh, and to non-carbon energy, solar, wind, etc. Everything changes. The price of energy might get a lot cheaper. Uh, being part of Europe matters a lot in this because the grid will become very important. Uh, if it's not windy here or not sunny here, it'll be windy somewhere else in Europe. So getting, swapping electricity uh, will become more and more important. We will see vehicles changing to electrical vehicles. Of course, this is going with many other things, machine intelligence, uh, robotics, so we will also see autonomous systems, uh, but I'm convinced that these lights, uh, those vehicles outside will look very different, or well, these won't look different, but they will be generated differently, the vehicles um, in 2030. So it's dramatic, 
and it will affect competitiveness of countries as well. We need to embrace this future. It will be better, cleaner, I think cheaper. It will create new jobs. Uh, and we need to support global efforts to deal with climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you.